Life after death. What is it like to live with a murderer in your family? For Gannett Media, I'm Dave Morris, chatting with my colleague Josh Delaney from the Oklahoman in Oklahoma City. What led you to this series? What's the genesis behind this? Uh, came upon it by accident about, uh, it's been about a year. I was a little short on stories to produce and uh, when that happens, I tend to drive around and just see what I can find. And I was on Classen Boulevard and I walked into an exterminator business, this old rundown building. I was curious to meet the owner and to find out how he is coping with all of the new development that is taking place in that area. Uh, they're building new homes, they're remodeling homes. Uh, the whole area over there is really, uh, really coming along well, but there's this old rundown exterminator business uh, in, in the middle of it. So I went in there and I spoke with a lady named Robbie Fullerton. She works there and she told me Bob, the owner, uh, is hard to get a hold of. But he's a great guy if I could ever get the interview with him. I've never spoken with Bob to this day. But Robbie Fullerton, I found out, uh, is a, what she calls a victim's justice advocate. She worked in the Oklahoma Department of Corrections for many years. She spearheaded a lot of work uh, for and on behalf of victims. She was a person who would let murder victims' families know where the convicted killer was throughout the prison system in Oklahoma. If they were moved around to different places, she would be the one to let them know. Uh, she would notify them of various uh, services that they had access to. Robbie is a delightful person to talk to, and she's very charming, and she's very vocal about her cause. As it turns out, her mother was murdered in 1980. Her mother, Maxine Fullerton, worked at what was then known as the uh, Helena Training School for Boys. And this was a place for uh, boys to go to if they've been convicted of particular crimes. In 1980, she, Maxine Fullerton, uh, sent one of the kids on an errand uh, for the school. Maxine worked as a, uh, uh, as a laundress. She's, she was great at sewing among her many talents. For a reward, she gave this kid a candy bar and a soda. In response, he knocks her out, uh, out of her sewing chair, rapes her, and stabs her with scissors 28 times. This set the course for Robbie's life. And of course, I've already introduced myself as a, as a journalist. Robbie also briefly served on the state's pardon and parole board. So she is very acquainted with the criminal justice system here in Oklahoma. One of the things that she brought up was that the public and the media are always curious about a convicted murderer's last meal before they are executed. And she asked me if I ever considered what a murder victim's last meal was. That murder victims never have a choice in, in what they're going to eat before they die. I said I never thought about that. I asked her what her mother's last meal was. And Robbie told me her mother's last meal was crackers and cheese on her 10 a.m. break. And I was fascinated right from the get-go about how they call themselves survivors. We can say those who are left behind, but relatives and loved ones of murder victims, these tiny details that they remember and, 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 and that seem to be amplified about their loved one's lives and, and how they died. So I thought, that's a great story. I'm going to write about murder victims' last meals. 
So I asked her to put me in contact with various uh, families. One particular family initially wanted to be interviewed for the story. But through Robbie, I found out it was so painful that they didn't, they didn't want to talk about that last meal. They didn't want to talk about what, what happened that night. She said, but I have some other people you can talk to. And as I do for these stories, it's, it's, a, it, it's a murder story. The Oklahoman has written about these things. We do follow-ups on them occasionally. And so in my research, I began to read all of our coverage of these various murders. And I contacted Robbie and I said, I, I might have something more than just a one-off story here about last meals of murder victims. I asked her what she thought about me perhaps doing a multi-part series with relatives of murder victims and exploring their lives in the years and in some cases decades beyond when the murder occurred. Because we're journalists and we know that we're gonna cover things uh, and, uh, until the trial is, is, is finished. Yeah, she mentions that the headlines are always what's the stage of the, of the court case or what's the murder. It's, it's never following well, how are the victims doing. Yes. We talk about criminal justice reform. She talks about victim's justice. Yes. And I, I've written several stories on criminal justice re reform. I'm, I'm familiar with um, uh, the arguments and the proponents of that. Now, the crime that was committed against her family was the, the worst of all. So she doesn't conflate a murder with, with what criminal justice reform advocates consider low-level crimes. But she is a fierce advocate for any victim of any crime. I told her that I had my car ransacked one night and I said I, I left my car doors unlocked, it was really my fault. And she said, you shouldn't ever think that way, that is not your fault. You are the victim of a crime. You did nothing wrong. You should be able to leave your car doors open whenever you want. And so when it comes to uh, murder victims and their stories, as I was asking her about potentially pursuing this, I said, look, I, I understand on some level this is really voyeuristic. And I'm, I'm exploiting these, these terrible stories in order for me to produce some news copy. I said, are you okay with that? Is this a worthy project to do? And she and every single survivor and several other people that I've interviewed for these stories said, yes, this is something that we rarely read about and we feel like we're forgotten and that nobody really cares for us. Because this has got to be hard. There's, there's so many benchmarks, bookmarks in life that you go through, whether it's holidays or in this situation, court dates, what are some of the issues that families are, have to go through once a family member has been murdered? One of the first things they are concerned about is how the body of their loved one is going to look uh, uh, for, to them and possibly to the public and other uh, friends and family, particularly if it's an open casket funeral. Again, it's one of those things that I would never have imagined. Her, her mother had a face and neck injury, so that, was, that presented a problem. And then every turn of the legal uh, wheel is heartache for them. And justice generally rolls along very slowly. So not only do they have media attention on themselves, these are mostly private citizens who don't deal with media, but they have media at their house. They turn on the television and they see news reports or they read uh, news sites and, and see all these things written about their family and about their loved one, and of course about the person that was uh, accused of this. So the, the, the turning of the legal wheel is very slow. There are court dates that they have to attend if a murderer is convicted, there are issues of clemency and going before, parole, uh, going before the parole board. They have to have those dates in mind. 
As soon as one of those dates is cleared, the clock ticks again over the next three to five years because they know another date is coming. They have to worry about where the murderer is located. Um, and there's not a lot of, of help for them from the state. And it's not as though they're asking for financial help, but they push for various forms of, of legislation. And they're really bothered that somebody can spend their life in prison and get an education and, 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 and still live. And they want to know, for murder victims, if somebody's lost a, a spouse or a parent, what, what is the public willing to do for the children of these people who maybe a breadwinner has been lost, they can't afford school, they're struggling to pay bills, and, and, and a host of these issues come up. And meanwhile, the murderer is in jail getting training and some education. Yes. And they, they understand that that person is living a, a miserable life. For sure. But yet, taxpayer dollars pay for a lot of the things that, for lack of a better word, they, they enjoy or, or use. So there, there are just a lot of issues that they deal with for years and for decades past that murder. I spoke with one lady who her goal in life is to stay alive long enough to watch her parents' killer be executed. You talk about the people in jail living a miserable life. That person is living a miserable life, the countdown for death row. You dove into uh, some of the stats of average stay on, on death row for murder. I think you said it was a dozen years? Yes, in Oklahoma, yeah. yeah. What about the solve rate? And how do police consider whether something is solved or not? How many of these murders are typically solved? Yeah. Typically, and this, this is true in Oklahoma and across the country, about two-thirds of murders are solved, which means a third of them are not solved. We might want to say resolved. Um, in some cases, a, a suspect dies. Um, in some cases, charges are never, um, never brought forward, but about a third of them go unsolved. I think it's shocking to the public when, when they first come across those statistics, that you have a third of a chance of, of uh, getting, getting away with that, that kind of crime. How do the families feel about that, if the suspects have got away, and how are they dealing with closure? from the stories that you've heard? There is, now I, I have previously written series at, at past news outlets about unsolved murders. In this series, I, I speak with a parent, uh, the mother of a man who was killed at a nightclub in Spencer. That has not yet been solved, and there are questions as to whether the person who was killed was actively involved in a gun battle. Regardless, uh, his death has not been solved. The mother has a suspect in mind. The sheriff's department initially ha had a, a, a suspect about a year and a half after, after the incident, but the DA declined to file charges, which typically means the DA doesn't think that he can win a conviction. So she believes this person, this suspect, lives in, in her community. There is constant worry that the person might show up behind her in line at a grocery store or pull up next to her at a stoplight. So for this person to still be around, there's, there's a, a lot of worry and a lot of fear. And we say closure a lot. That There's not quite been that for her because it's not it's not been resolved. She doesn't feel that justice has been done in this case. And it's going on about eight years now. And for eight years, uh, according to your reporting, there's been a, a visual that she, that she sees, which I guess can be good and bad. A memorial. Yes. She, her, her son ultimately died, as she calls it, in a ditch near a pole on, on a rundown stretch of road. 
As a mother, she's really angry with her son for spending time in this area because she, she didn't believe he would be over there. He spent a lot of his time in, in Bricktown in Oklahoma City, which is safe for the most part. This pole is, she has decorated this pole. It is, it is what we would call a roadside memorial. There have been lights on it, flowers, people uh, drop things off there a lot. They'll, they'll leave notes and remembrances and things like that. But she's also been the victim of some cruelty in that area. Uh, she has had people drive by and, and yell expletives about, about her son. So it's really tough, but she says she likes the fact that there's another place she can go to besides a graveyard to uh, think and reflect uh, on, on her son's life. You know, thinking and reflecting, gosh, that's got to be so hard because in that case, she's remembering a final conversation and how it was a little bit different than previous, hey, goodbye, love you. It was a little bit different. We talked about last meals. I'm sure the victim's families are thinking about last conversations. They do, and I was, um, I've been doing this for so long, so it's hard to shake me, but the, the, the last conversation she had with her son was just, uh, just haunting. It, it was really moving. There are words and phrases that the relatives of murder victims remember uh, uh, about their loved ones. I spoke with a woman who's, uh, she was five years old when her father was murdered and one of her most uh, prized possessions is a cassette recording uh, he had made back in the mid 80s, early to mid 80s, uh, strumming his guitar, uh, talking to his wife, telling her he loves her. And some of the things he spoke on that cassette recording are actually engraved on his uh, headstone at the cemetery. So it, it's just small little things that speak to the character of, of the people that, that died. You know, Robbie, used, used, she jokes all the time that her mother would sing around the house and she sounded like a trumpet. And uh, so these, and that's the other thing too, there, 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 there's a, a look of, of agony in the eyes of all of these people that just never goes away. But they also have this indomitable spirit where there, there's, there's humor and there's, there's light and there's hope and a lot of it is rooted in the relationships that they had with, with uh, the people in their lives. That, that yeah, that, that's where I was going with the final questions, Josh, is what are you, what are you hearing from these families? How do they cope? And, and perhaps their messages to other families who might be going through a, a trauma. You know, what are some tools that they have found to, to cope and get through and keep going? Uh, some, some hunker down and live uh, a, a quiet lives. They go to work. They don't necessarily want to speak publicly about it uh, much, if, if at all. One person I spoke with said it was really, this was really the first time she has really come out about what, what she has had to deal with. Others, like the, the, the mother whose son was killed, that becomes their purpose in life. I want this solved. Others become advocates for other victims. They take part in um, groups that, uh, 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 they call them murder survivors, uh, groups where they lean on one another and then you have people like Robbie who's been a part of the, those groups uh, who who become advocates they, they they keep tabs on laws and legislation and they write newsletters to keep people informed about what's going on one of the things that really struck me was when these people read or see news about a murder they think in a completely different way than we do. Especially as journalists, we get a bit numb to it. Unfortunately, it becomes a statistic, another number. We have other stories we're, we're working on, and we have deadlines. It's very easy to not really process what it is we're writing about. For a lot of these folks, they know the exact pain that relatives are going through, and their hearts break all over again. It's, it's another emotional trauma for them. For some of them, they know that they're gonna get a new 
member of their uh, survivors group. So they, they are preparing to welcome people into a fellowship that, that, that none of us really want to be a part of. What about you, Josh? How are you handling this? These are not easy conversations <laughs> to have. It's, it's, been, it's been okay. I think, I think the, the, the first interview on this for me was probably the toughest because I was interviewing a, a, a woman who had not been in the spotlight about these issues. And I expected the tears to come and of course she, she cried a lot. And the, 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 the thing was we were going from spot to spot following what would have been the path her father took before he died. And so we're going back to places that, that can be emotionally triggering and devastating. And some of that happened. So I still have a soft spot within me and, and part of me felt like, why, why am I doing this? I'm, a, I'm really exploiting this and I felt like a jerk. But she was the one that kept encouraging me and is the one that, that, that was excited about telling her story. I, I'm excited too, but I have to be careful about not doing emotional damage to people. As far as, far as myself, there's always a joy in writing stories, not necessarily these types of stories, but being able to speak with people and, and allow them to, to open up their heart to complete strangers and tell the world uh, what this is like. Uh, to, to, to go through. So the, the toughest parts for me have been when I put the stories away for a little bit and then I might have a, a whiskey or two and then go back and start to read and then really reflect on the things that they're saying. That, those, those parts have, uh, have really been tough or I should say tougher but then in speaking with them I get encouraged again and they say keep going, when is this going to run, when is this going to run? Um, so, so they're excited about it, and that, that gets, gets me re, uh, refocused and I guess, I guess it is it. amazing how much communication and just being able to talk with people really helps. One final thought, this whole summer, this whole year has been tough on a lot of people being quarantined because of COVID. You know, when you're, you're somewhat even more isolated than perhaps before, those memories and those, those thoughts get, get louder. Did, did anybody share any thoughts along those lines, or perhaps is that something you dealt with? as you start to, to look back because you can't kind of get away, you're isolated. Yeah, I think perha perhaps I dealt with it on the COVID angle a little bit more than them. Uh, I think this is a constant with them. I don't, I don't think these memories and these uh, reflections of what they have to deal with, I, they may ebb and flow, but I, I think they're a constant. I, I, I think they're a, a steady. and. They think about things that I, I would never have imagined. I spoke with a source the other day whose parents were murdered together. And she says to me, I'm kind of glad they were murdered together. I didn't want to see one of them live without the other, knowing that the other was murdered. And she asked me if, she, if I thought that was a weird thought. I said, no, that makes perfect sense when you put it that way. That's, that's not strange to me at all. So I don't, I don't think the lockdown and the other strange news that's gone on has, um, uh, I, I, I don't think it's made it any worse than, than, than it can be. My, my guess is if people are quarantined and they just have nothing else to do, perhaps the level of, of re reflection is, is raised. But I know for me, having to concentrate on these stories and you know, sitting in the house all day long, I. I tend to think about it a lot. Josh, thank you. We appreciate your reporting. Thanks for sharing the stories of Life After Death series. Thank you.